introduce Dan Lyons. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Dan is uh, the writer of a book called Disrupted. He's been a writer on Silicon Valley on HBO. Um, and he's also, earlier in his career, been a writer for Forbes and Fortune and some other magazines you might have read. Uh, Dan is here for two purposes, um, in addition for the old guy diversity. Um, number one is um, Dan has a really good um, career reinvention story. Dan is going through a lot of what a lot of you folks are going through um, and has been uh, going down this path for a few years. Since the age of 50, he's reinvented himself three times. Um, and the other reason is um, Dan has been successful and he's got some really interesting insights to share. So, Dan? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I uh, forgive me, I, I, oh, we're gonna move this to the, okay, I'm following him. Um, as successful is, is a word they should use in quotes uh, when discussing my non-career, but um, uh, I wanted to thank you for that uh, nice intro and, um, and the invitation to speak here at this uh, place. This is so beautiful. I've never been to this museum anymore. Um, why older workers still matter. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a tough, tough assignment, you know. Um, I had a, a, a bit of housekeeping that uh, uh, Chicago native uh, Hugh Hefner has died. I don't know if any of you have heard this. Um, he was 91, and I, I like to think that he was discovered by his massively inappropriately young wife who is extremely relieved that it's finally over, you know? <laughs> but uh, um, uh, it's just, you get the money now. No more having to, you know, the leathery old baseball glove guy climbing on you, uh, you know, just uh, so. Uh, so speaking of creepy old guys, why am I here? Is the uh, the, the transition, um, and I'm here because I, I wrote this book about being the old guy at a startup. You know, I got laid off and, and uh, went to work at a startup. I was not the oldest one there, but almost, and. Um, you know, the, the day began with a talk about millennials and how they're different. And I know they're like the shiny new thing. They're like the shiny new toy that everybody loves. And what do they need? What should we give them? And, and my generation is like the, the, that old pair of shoes in the back of the closet. And you're like, I don't know, can I still wear them? They're still okay, but should I just throw them out? You know, um, <laughs> it sucks. I'm here to talk about the, the twilight years, you know, the golden years of, of your career, right? Um, Oh, oh, I made this slide. Uh, hi, I'm the token old guy, right? This has become my new job now. This is what I do. I go around to conferences, and I'm the old guy. I'm the token old guy. My kids, I have young kids, because I, I had kids late. They think this is hilarious. They love that I am, like, Mr. Old Guy. Um, I don't know, does, do, and you, obviously, all, you know the guy on the right, but do, does anybody know who the guy on the left is? Anybody recognize him, where he comes from? So, he, he, he comes from a Viagra ad, right? Which I think is, is great. Like, that, like, I am now, when they first had Viagra ads in the late 90s, it was Bob Dole. It was legitimately old guys who had legitimate problems. But now, they have these silver fox guys, right? These, like, now, I am so old that the guy I aspire to be is the rugged Viagra-taking guy, right? Like, that's, that's where I am. You know, they're, and they're all, like, driving muscle cars, and they're playing guitars, you know? The one I love the best is the couple in the two tubs like side by side, like what is that, right? Like I don't get it. Like you, you're outside, there's no plumbing. Is there water in the tub? And if, if there is, how does it stay hot? Like this is what I think about. And, and also it's like, it's like the, it's getting late in the day, the sun's going down. You know there are bugs, right? There are mosquitoes, that's where I live. If you're in a tub in the backyard, if I told my wife, let's go out and get in a tub, two tubs. We can't touch each other, but let's just sit side by side in tubs. It's, it doesn't even, it doesn't even, well, you know, yeah. Um, um, but really, yeah, I realize now the best version of me, like if I worked out, I lifted weights, and I, I, I dieted, and I got a little work done, and everything, and like, is I could almost be as cool as the Viagra-taking impotent man, like on TV, right? That's, that's my dream in life, right? Um, um, 
so yeah, I'm a little pigeonholed now. Um, the, you, have, you may have seen this story in McSweeney's recently. Welcome to the startup where everyone is 23 years old because we believe old people are visually displeasing and out of ideas, right? So um, <laughs> for some reason, when this story came out, everybody I know and people I don't know all sent it to me like, hey man, I thought you'd like this. I'm like, no, why? <laughs> why? Why? Seriously, people on Twitter that I don't know would tag me, hey, Dan Lyons, check this out, right? Um, <laughs> Right? This is it. I write one book about being an old guy at a tech startup, and now like, it's, I'm typecast for the rest of my life. Right? Every reporter that does a story about age bias in tech or age bias anywhere, I get the call. Would you like to give us a quote? I give them the same quotes um, over and over. It, you know, it's, it's like being the actor who gets called for the role in the movie that's like, you know, unattractive person on subway. You know, or weird looking man selling pretzels, right? And, you know, and then your agent calls and says, like, hey, there's a, you know, you want to read for this? And you're like, ah, it's kind of insulting, right? But on the other hand, like, I got kids, I need work, I'll do it, you know? So, um, and, and I don't know what's next for me. Like, I think the cricket phone ads, you know? I, seriously, this is true. When my book came out, I was like, you know, you, you plot and scheme, how can I market it? I was like, AARP. Right? The, seriously. Right? And we called, we flacked them, we begged the AARP to write about my book. I realized that is, that's the, the lowest you get. You're begging the AARP <laughs> to write about you. Um, but honestly, I don't care anymore. I just don't care, you know? I, I got a car, pair of shoes, the Allen Edmond shoes are kind of expensive, and the sales guy's like, well, you know anything about these shoes? You know, you'll have these shoes for the rest of your life. I was like, dude, that's not a big deal for me anymore. That's, <laughs> you know, everything I buy right now, I will have for the rest of my life, right? Like, everything, right? I, I, we bought a couch. I'm like, I'm going to die on this couch. This is, where I, this is where I die. This is it. We're not buying another couch, you know? This is it. So, um, but I should, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to... We're going to talk about two things today, right? Um, one is boomers and Gen X at work, right? Like what, what, sort of based on my experience at a startup, being out of place because of my age, I wanted to maybe give you some perspective of how someone in my generation sees work, how we see learning and development, not that I know a lot about learning and development, but how we uh, view the world, what the world looks like, to, what work looks like to us today. And the second thing I want to talk about is reinvention, right? This idea of um, the process that I've gone through, really. I went from being a journalist to being uh, a marketing guy to being a TV writer to now being basically an unemployed man who does old guy jokes and, uh, you know, uh, and a thing. So uh, what advice can I offer from this story? Because I think there are some lessons from, from the, uh, what I've gone through. And I think some of you are practitioners. You might be my age, and you might be facing what, what I was talking to Todd before, and I call it the, sort of that oh shit moment, like oh shit, like oh god, this is real, right? Like, um, and you realize you know, your, your world has changed. Um, and that's what happened in my world, right? I was at Newsweek when Newsweek went under, right? When they did the last print issue. Right? The, the, and if you want to know what it looks like when a company or an industry doesn't pay attention to change, Newsweek is like the poster child for this. The magazine that was like 80 years old was, you know, any of you over 40 know what Newsweek was, right? Was sold for a dollar, right? A dollar, right? We're all, uh, and some assumed debt. But, um, and I think from what little I know about learning and development is that you guys are in a field that maybe feels like where we were in, in, in the media business 10 years ago, right? You look around, you see entire industries blowing up, entire companies getting blown up, right? Um, in our business, what happened was everything about the media business, from the way content was created to the way it was distributed to the way it was consumed, everything along that chain changed, right? And I, I, I think the same thing is happening for you guys, from what I've, I've heard from Todd and others, is that everything about the way you create learning content, the way you deliver it, the way it's consumed, that's all changing, the, the entire chain. Um, so there are new skills to learn, there are new roles that didn't exist. That's what happened to us in the media business. There were suddenly these new jobs that we didn't have. We had people who paid attention to quantifying our web traffic. Like, and suddenly they had a lot of power in the organization. And the, on the print side, people like me, we thought of them as peons. But they actually had a lot of power, right? Um, tech suddenly became much, much more important to the media business than it had ever been. We always viewed IT as sort of like these guys out back who just kept our laptops running. And suddenly, the people who were running the web, who understood the analytics, became very, very powerful in the organization. And our, ironically, what we did, 
the guys who just wrote stuff. We thought we were the most important people. We started to realize we were really not very important. The skills we had were, if that's the only skill you had, that wasn't really enough anymore, right? So, so the question is, how do you leap from the role you have, if you're my age inside a company? How do you leap into one of these new roles? How do you take the skills that you have and sort of repurpose them or dress them up in new clothes? Or how do you get new skills, right? And basically, that is, when I think of it now, it never felt like this along the way. But for the last 10 years, that's essentially, I think, what I've been doing, right? Um, so my story is, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story that's in my book, right? And um, th there's more of it there. But I, I got laid off at Newsweek. I always wanted to work at a startup. I realized that media is changing. I didn't want to just get another media job, and be, there weren't any anyway. And I went to work at this a startup in Cambridge called HubSpot in a sort of content role. But um, I was twice the age of the average employee, right? And I wanted to see everything about the new work. Like, I would visit the Huffington Post. I wrote a story about them when I was at Newsweek. And I was really jealous of them. They were having so much fun. You know, they're all young and cool, and everybody's having a blast. And Newsweek, you know, fun is not a word you would describe the last few years at a place like this going out of business. Everybody's, you know, miserable, right? Um, so I wanted to kind of throw myself into the deep end of this and, and just see this new way of working, right? And, and the first thing I was told at HubSpot, which is, and I was told this over and over and over again, outright, that whatever you did in your last job, right? We had people there who had worked a couple of years at Google, right? Wherever you used to work, whatever title you used to have, like, it doesn't matter at all, right? You're, you, you're starting from zero here. It means nothing. Your experience does not count for anything. First of all, most of the people I worked with had never read Newsweek. They had heard of it. They had seen it at a dentist's office, but they literally were not impressed by it at all, right? Um, in fact, if anything, your experience was seen as a bad thing because it meant you were stuck in like old ways of doing things. They, they, they really had no regard for experience, which was a shock to me. Not that I expected everybody to, you know, sort of, you know, think I was great, but it was just, it was shocking to think like, no, you're nothing, right? It, um, we're special, we're smart, we're the ones who get it, and you old guys, like the people say to me, do you know how to use Twitter? I'd be like, yeah, I know how to use Twitter. It's, like, it's not that hard, you know? Uh, <laughs> but um, the average age was 26, and I was 52. I was literally twice the average age, right? And it wasn't by accident they had all these young people, right? The CEO was doing this on purpose. He, he specifically told, he told the New York Times, we're specifically trying to recruit and retain millennials because and this is a quote that just sticks in my head, because gray hair and experience are really overrated, right? This is my boss, right? I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> like, this is a few months after I started. Kids called me grandpa. Like, one guy was like, your nickname's gonna be Grandpa Buzz, right? The PR woman came up to me one day, and she met well. She was like, I wanna do a story called Old Dog's New Tricks. And I'm like, yeah, we're gonna pitch it like, you know, you really have adapted, you've really learned. It's, you know, old people can learn. And I'm like, ah. Can I just think about that for a second? Like, I, I never even thought of myself as old, right? I, I Newsweek, I wasn't the old, you know? So I realized I wasn't starting out as zero. I was actually starting out less than zero, right? I, there was a bias against people my age, and it was, a, it was a, a big and active and strong bias, and I had to overcome it. And I still figured, you know what, this is a good thing, right? Like, this is gonna be hard, but like, if I really wanna learn how this new world works, like, just dive in. It's gonna suck, it's gonna be painful, but, um, you know, dive in. So, uh, Actually, I, I was a little wrong about that. Anyway, this is from my book. You know, first day, and I won't tell you the whole story, but by the end of the first day, I was freaking out. Like, I was freaking out. Like, I, I have made a huge mistake. This is really, really bad. Um, and as I say in the book, I, I keep, I have this voice telling me you've made a mistake, and soon I will learn that, like, the voice is correct, right? So uh, this is the lobby of HubSpot, right? And it's um, basically, it had every startup cliche that you can possibly imagine. They had dogs in the office, right? We had uh, all the bright basic colors. We had beanbag chairs instead of chairs for meetings, right? We had beer, I mean, beer bashes, beer in the refrigerator, free food. We had, they had these lacrosse bros who would do push-up in the lobby at lunchtime. They had a push-up, like, yeah, bro, do you even lift? And I was like, fuck no, dude, I, 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 I'm going to lunch. You get out of my way, you know? Why are you all lying on the floor? Get the fuck up, you know? Like, so, um, so I like to say it was like, it was like, you know, sorry, they had guns, you know? But they, um, I mean, these kind of, you know, so, but it was like, I like to say it was like a cross between a frat house, a Montessori kindergarten, and a Scientology compound, right? It was like, it had uh, all three of those things, right? So, so yeah, 
Uh, here are some pictures, right? So we had the beanbag chair and the candy wall. They were really proud of the candy wall. My first day, they gave me a tour, like, the candy wall is really special. It's, it captures our culture. We're fun. And I'm like, I don't give a shit about candy, dude. I'm a, I was a lot fatter then. I'm trying to lose weight. I'm, gonna, I'm practically diabetic, you know? And, I, and at my age, anyway, so there's the nap room. Where a guy's in there working on his laptop. It's like, dude, it's, take a nap or get out, right? You know? And then this one is, they called it the camping room. Now, I swear to God, I'm old, but like, that's a freaking supply closet, right? That's not, that's a supply closet with two chairs in it. Come on, right? And some, a mural, right? But they love, what are you going to go? I'm just going to go sit in the camping room. Why? Why you do something, you know? Um, so I'm a grumpy curmudgeon. I was when I was 25, though, right? So I'm like, this is either the worst thing ever or the best thing ever, right? This is great, right? And these guys, all love this shit. They think this is great, right? They came to work here because of this, right? So then they had, on the Scientology end of things, we had this like training. We had two weeks of training. You were supposed to learn how to use the software, but it was really like cult indoctrination, right? It's like brainwashing, right? And they would say like, what is your superpower? They told, they told these kids, I'm, the, I'm sitting there next to this kid who's like, yeah, I just graduated from college and uh, yeah, I live with my parents, but I think I'm going to get my own place. So, uh, do you have your own place? I'm like, yeah, dude, I have my own place. I, get, you know, I, have a, I have a house. I got kids in grammar school. You know, yes, I have my own place. I have my car. I got all that stuff, you know? <laughs> anyway, so they go around and they're like, you know, it's harder to get a job here than to get into Harvard, which, you know, not really. But anyway, and that's how special you are. Thousands of people wanted the job, but you got it. You. That's how special you are. You must have a superpower. So we had to go around and talk about like, what makes you a special snowflake. You know the thing where introduce yourself and tell a funny story. Like, I freaking hate that, right? Like, I'm, I'm old. I hate that shit, right? So I'm dreading it. It's coming around. And like, I play in a heavy metal band. Right? And I'm going to get to me. And I'm like, I'm the only one who's had a colonoscopy, right? And they're like, and they're like no, 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 no. And I'm like, no, kid, seriously, if you, when you turn 50, is a hose, it's bad, uh, you know? It's serious, no, uh, no, yeah, just what you think, right? And they're like, no way, yeah, I'll tell you. Anyway, they had, they fetishized culture. So they had a culture code, right? Creating a company we love. And the big thing, the way to succeed was just to love the company. Just show how much you love the company, right? One of the founders made this up and just said, these are the things you have to do. One thing was heart, H-E-A-R-T. To be HubSpotty, you had to have heart. You had to be humble, effective, adaptable, remarkable, and transparent. I was none of those, right? So I, I, I had a two out of five on my heart score. Um, the two founders came from MIT, and they thought, in addition to making software, they were going to reinvent how companies were made. Like, those old companies, they don't do everything wrong. We're not going to have an HR department. I hate HR. I always, HR sucks. No org chart. They had 500 people. No org chart. You couldn't find out who reported to whom, right? And then the big breakthrough was this founder, you can't really see him, decided he's going to start bringing a teddy bear to meetings. He wrote an article on LinkedIn about it, how proud he was. The teddy bear represents the customer, and we're supposed to be solving for the customer at all times, and people forget that. So I bring my teddy bear, who's the customer, and the teddy bear sits, Molly the teddy bear, sits at a meeting, and any decision we make, we have to run it by Molly, right? This is our CMO. For real, a real guy sitting like next to a teddy bear, right? And what blew my mind is that nobody laughed at it. Like I read it, I was like, this is freaking stupid, right? So I, I sat face to face, you know, monitor to monitor with this, this kid. And I was like, dude, shh, the teddy bear thing's crazy, right? He's like, no, I think it's really awesome. I'm like, come on, dude. Like, nobody's around. Tell me the truth. You know this sucks, right? This is an idiotic thing, right? If you did this at Newsweek, if the managing editor at Newsweek did this, people would start bringing in teddy bears in, like, bondage outfits, you know, and, like, you know, <laughs> teddy bears being hanged. It would be awful, right? You would never live it down. But nobody would laugh. I called a friend of mine, who, a former journalist who became a marketing guy, who had kind of counseled me as I was making this transition. I was like, I know the corporate world is weird, man, but, like, I told him the teddy bear, is this what happened? He's like, no, that's Jonestown. Get out, get out now. This is not, this is not normal, even, even for corporate people, right? And they had a big Halloween party. This is the big, we dare to be different. Like, we're so different, right? They were the most conformist people ever, right? But like, we dare to be different, right? And the main thing was just to be peppy. That's a real picture of people jumping. You never can have your picture taken. Millennials, for some reason, have to jump when they have their picture taken. I don't know why. And do it over and over until they get them all in the air, you know? Um, I think they put Zoloft in the water, because I was like, well, I'm not drinking it, but like something's wrong here, right? And 
they had a thing, I, I came to call these things praisegasms. They figured out that the way to get attention in the organization, the way to look good and get a promotion, was not to be good yourself, but to be praising others. I mean, this little thing, cheers for peers, where you could constantly praise people. But the worst one was, in my department, in marketing, they had about 60 people. They would have this thing where someone would want to say that, you know, Amber did a great job last week. So, in my world, you would send Amber a note saying, hey, the other thing you did last week, you, that was great. You were, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And maybe if you really wanted to be a mensch, you know, you CC her boss and say, by the way, this person, just, she's great. Really, give her a raise, right? But what they did was they would send, you get an email to the whole department, 60 people, right? Just want to say that Amber ran the blog last week all by herself because someone was on, were on vacation and she just kicks ass. Amber is awesome, right? <laughs> and you'd be like, okay. Great. But then the protocol was everyone who got it had to do a reply to all, right? <laughs> Saying, yeah, Amber, you kick ass, woo, right? Like, and I'm sitting there, so your inbox would just fill up with this praise gathering. Like, it's nine in the morning, like, shit, Jesus Christ, right? And I'm like, and I'm just delete, delete, delete. I'm not even reading. Yeah, she's great. She's fucking great. She's terrific. Great. Yeah, she ran the blog. Wow. I'm so impressed, right? But then I decided, I don't want to look like a dick, plus I like being a dick. So I start saying, and I start joining in. Like, Amber is awesome, woo! And I put like eight million exclamation points, like, and they'd be like, dude, stop that. Like, they figured out that I didn't mean it somehow. They figured out, they, they could detect sarcasm. They could. They, they, you have to be careful with millennials, because they can detect sarcasm. I thought maybe they didn't, because they're so earnest. Um, and this is the most crazy thing of all. When they fired you, they called it graduation. And I'm not making that up. And they tried to be cheery about it. Because you know what, it didn't work out. And we'd get this email saying, hey everybody, just want you to know, or hey team, just want you to know that you know, Derek has graduated. We can't wait to see what he's gonna do with his superpowers in his next big rock star adventure. Go Derek, you know? And be like, you just fired that poor bastard, right? You know? And you'd look over, his desk is already empty. Like they cleared him out, like, you know what I mean? No warning. People get fired like, oh no, no, right now you're fired. You know, just take your stuff, go. Right? It was like living in Argentina in the 1970s. This happened all the time. People just disappeared, right? right? It was like spinal tap drummers. Boof! You know, just like, you look over, there's like a pile of dust, ash on the chair, right? Like, what happened to Derek? Oh, he graduated, you know? So, uh, and my, my, my huge dread, because I knew very early on, like, I'm going to get fired here, right? Like, but I just didn't want them to call it graduation. Just please, you know, don't call it graduation when you throw me out of here, right? And they didn't. They were nice about it. But, uh, um, so, so I failed, needless to say, right? I didn't even fail. I, I refused to quit. So they did the thing where they can't fire you because you're old. So they just try to make you really miserable so you quit. And like had this sociopath boss who would just like, just totally did this amazing mind effery on me for like weeks and weeks. And I would keep notes like I can't, because I, every day I'd come in like, what's he going to do today? This is amazing. Like, <laughs> Like, this guy's really creative at this. He's really good at this. I couldn't do this, you know? I wouldn't even know how to do it, right? Um, so I left. And then after I left, though, I wondered, like, why didn't I fit in, right? Like, wh what, wh why did I fail, right? And I came to think that there's one thing that distinguishes my generation, which I will lump in as Gen X and boomers, from millennials, and that's fear, right? I think that the millennials, the people I worked with, had no fear. Right? They didn't care if they failed. They would try ridiculous, I mean, really stupid things that were obviously going to fail. And their boss would let them go down and do this thing, and it would blow up in their face. Uh, but, and, and there would be no repercussion. You could, you could totally screw up, and you wouldn't get fired. You wouldn't even, you'd, get, you'd get a promotion. Like, that was awesome. Good try. So I realized that, you know, um, at my generation, Facebook, if you look at Facebook, how many things they've announced. You could, I used to make these do these articles where I'd make a list of all the initiatives that Facebook rolled out with great fanfare, this is gonna change the world, and then six months later they kinda quietly close it down, right? And they don't care, they're not embarrassed. When I was at Newsweek, if we had some big new initiative, you would have to study it for six months, we'd pilot it, because the thing we had was institutional fear. We had individual fear, but we had institutional fear. That what, if, what if we launch this thing and it, and it sucks? People laugh at us, it's like, well, so, yeah, so what, right? Like, and we were, we were, we were sort of, hidebound by our own fear, right? But I want to tell those of you who are younger why our generation has fear. And this is something to think about if you're teaching them, right? First of all, 
Oh God, the typeface is huge. Um, anyway, this is a cover of Newsweek in 2011, Beached White Male. I was still working there at the time thinking like, that'll never happen to me. And a year later, bam, you know, I was one, right? But he had a big job, a big office, a big bonus, and now he's all washed up. Like the crash of 2008, 2009, 10 hit my generation harder than anybody else, right? If you were a little older than me, you were in your 60s, you could call it early retirement and kind of get out, right? If you were young and entering the workforce, fine, right? Um, my generation got devastated. Like everybody my age knows people. I know lots of people whose career just ended then, long before they thought it was going to end, right? And, you know, these are the years where, you know, you're not ready to retire, right? These are the years from 50 to 65 where in, in the old days, that's where you made your nut. That's when you made your money, right? Your kids had gone to college. You, th that was the way you, you were piling up the money. Maybe you were coasting a little bit, and you were going to run out the clock till 65, and now that's gone, right? Now you're driving an Uber. Half the time I get in, I, I use Lyft, but half the time I get in, it scares the shit out of me because it's a guy who looks just like me, right? And they're always trying to put a brave face on it, like, yeah, I'm just doing this for a while. Like, yeah, sure you are, you know? Um, you know it went from, like, people my age, you were worrying about, like, did we save enough for the kid's college, for retirement? Now it's like, can I pay the mortgage, like, this month, right? So that's what happened to our generation, right? Then, when we do get into the workforce, this is an article I wrote when my book came up, right? There's age bias, right? And it used to be 65 when your career ended, then it was 60, 55. Now it's like 50. In Silicon Valley, it's 40. Like, people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, 40. You should, you should be done now. Like, what? And, and, and there's no hiding it. They at least lie about gender and race. Oh, we're trying to do better. No, they're not, right? But, uh, but with AIDS, they're like, no, yeah, why should we? You, know, you guys suck, right? You're idiots. You know, just get out of here, right? So it's an open bias, and that's what we're swimming against, right? We're also living in this time, right, that the World Economic Forum calls the, the, um, the fourth industrial revolution, right, where entire industries are blowing up. There's chaos, there's confusion. Nobody quite knows just globally where this is all going to go. That's sort of the large background issue. You have things like AI, robotics, genomics coming in that are changing utterly the way we work, right? And then you have this new compact. And I think people have already talked about this today, but this is new deal between employers and employees. And the deal is, you know, you're not coming here for a career. This is a transaction, right? This is a tour of duty. You might be for two years, right? And there's this slogan that, that Netflix came up with in their famous culture code, we're a team, not a family, meaning, you know, we're like a pro sports team, and, you know, if we find a better shortstop, you're out. And I think that's fine if you're a pro athlete and you make a lot of money, but if you're working in a call center, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think it really maps, right? It really just means you have no job security, right? HubSpot had taken this. This was part of their culture code, too, in the, in the building the company we love, which is, oh, buried down deep. By the way, we're a team, not a family. So we want you to love us, but you, mm, you know, see you later, right? Um, so this new compact, I think, to people my age is really shocking. Because when we entered the workforce in the 80s, things like pensions still existed. I, I worked at Forbes in the 90s. We still had a, a real pension, an actual pension that was funded and a 401k, right? We had the expectation maybe that we were going to work someplace and have health care for the rest of our lives after we retired. Those things still existed then. People who are younger now can't believe this, but this is the world we entered in the 80s, right? And this also th seems kind of callous to us, right? That, that, that our company feels this way about it. And maybe it's refreshing that they're honest about it. Maybe they always felt this way and they were just lying. But it just feels kind of callous and rude to be told that. When we entered the workforce, there was a famous, the famous sort of cliche was, our best assets walk out the door every night. We really have to take care of them, right? Um, meanwhile, inside work, everything's changing, right? There's all these new tools, Slack. You know, not that Slack is that complicated, but, you know, that's the one. Do you know how you use Slack? Oh, God, no. You know. um, and in your field, you know, the way you learn is different. The other thing that's changing, though, that blows my mind is it's not just the tools. It's the actual organization itself, right? So you have flat organizations. You have agile. You have lean. All these things that I think are like rings of hell. I think they're just invented to torment people, right? I think they're, they're created so that sadists have a new way to fuck with people at work. Like, you know, <laughs> are you being agile? You know, nobody even knows what Agile means. I, I've, been, I've, worked, I've done a lot of research on Agile. There's 8 million books. They all contradict each other. There is no Agile. Agile just means whatever some psycho that you work for <laughs> wants to tell you what it means, right? Um, right? Um, so people want to learn. I think there's a huge appetite for learning. But I think we learn for different reasons. 
I think millennials are learning so they can move up in the organization, right? People in my generation are learning so we can hang on, right? And, and, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean, I think it's valid. I think it's actually okay to be pragmatic about your work. And I think that's another difference about my generation is that we view work as something we do to make money that pays for our life. I don't think we fall for this bullshit about it being a mission and, you know, being stupid. They told these poor kids at HubSpot, this is a really important company. We're changing the world. We sold email spam. That's what we sold. Software that let you spam people. If anything, we made the world a worse place, right? <laughs> you know that shit email you get that looks like it's from a real person, but you know it's just canned? That was us, right? <laughs> oh my God, now we're transforming the world. Like, no, we're not. Uh, a quick digression to people who are younger in the audience. When I started working, this is what the world looked like. This was a computer. Only 10% of the people in America had one at home, right? Um, this was a phone, right? <laughs> it cost $4,000, $8,000 in today's dollars, right? Um, you know, we sat in little cubicles, we used a lot of paper, and either, either you or someone you know had that haircut, the mullet, right? <laughs> they had a mullet, right? Um, and, <laughs> sorry. Um, so now we go to work and it looks like this, and we're like, what? Like, you know, we didn't play beer pong, and we don't need to play, but even when we were young, we didn't come into the office and expect our company to, oh, today's beer pong day. It's tequila tasting day. Like, we didn't have it. Lumberjacks lived in the forest. They didn't come into the <laughs> office. We didn't, you know, they didn't have hair gel and laptops. They cut down trees. It's like, what, was there a tree accident on three? I don't know. You know <laughs> Dudley Dulash, he's here to fix that broken branch. Um, so summing this up, right? Just in the course of our career, and since we started work till now, right, all these things have happened. And the one I want to get to is appended by crash. We've seen three massive crashes in our lifetime. 1987, there was a huge stock market crash. 2001, the dot-com bubble burst. 2008, the housing bubble burst. Each time, we got wiped out, right? People had their retirement savings wiped out. People lost everything in these crashes. It's made us a little cautious, right? It maybe made us a little, a little gun shy about, you know, taking chances and, you know, swing for the fence. Like, we're just trying to hang the fuck on, right? So, um, and there's a new definition of old, which is now 40, which means we're all, you know, like elderly, you know? When, when HubSpot was trying to make fun of my book, they marketed against the book to try to kill my book. One thing, they made a thing, I was Grandpa Simpson going out, old man yells a cloud, like, you know, like, like, I'm not Grandpa Simpson. I still get it, kind of. Anyway. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is reinvention. And I'm running short of time, so I'm going to talk really fast. But just quickly, the story of how I got from being a Forbes reporter to like where I am now, right? Um, um, basically, in the 90s and the 2000s, I was working at Forbes, and I was a print journalist. And I wrote these. These are two of my covers. Like, you can tell what an exhilarating job it was. I got to interview Lou Gerstner at IBM. Like, what a dick, right? And uh, <laughs> like, just a complete monster, just a sociopath. He came from RGR Reynolds, went to IBM, and then went off to like Blackstone Group or something. So he's just making the world a better place, right? And, uh, and while, while at IBM, he like gutted the pension fund, laid off thousands of people. But great guy, great human being. And I wrote about Attack of the Blogs, which is kind of a fun story. But while I was there, something happened. Around 2006, I started realizing, oh my god, like I'm a print journalist, right? And print isn't going to be around. I got to learn to be an online journalist. And in those days, we had, we had separate staffs. We had a dot-com staff and a print staff. And the print staff, we were the major league team. We were the Yankees, or you know, not the Yankees. I'm from Boston. We were the Red Sox. But, and then there was a farm league, and the farm league was the dot-com guys, right? It was where you went if you screwed up on print, they put you down there. Or you, if you were there, you were hoping to make it to print. But I did something radical. I went to my boss and I said, look, I know I'm a print guy, I've been here for a long time. I want to transfer to the dot-com, right? Which was like unheard of. Like, why would you do that? I'm like, no, I, dude, I want to do it. And this is what happened that blew my mind. They didn't go, oh, awesome. They were like, nah, nah no, we don't need you. Yeah, you're old, you're in your 40s, you don't get it. It's a lot faster over here. And I was like, oh, shit. That was my oh, shit moment, right? Like, oh, my God, like, yeah, I'm screwed because this thing's going to go out of business. And when it does, I'm just going to be an old print guy who knows how to write in Word. But that was it. You know, that's all I knew how to do. So I thought, i got to learn to blog. I'm going to do it on my own time. I'm going to learn about HTML so that when the shit hits the fan and I'm going to look for a job, I can at least say, well, I know how to blog, right? So I started this blog. I started a bunch of blogs. There were three platforms. I started all over the place, different blogs. And I started this one where I pretended to be Steve Jobs, right? <laughs> and, and the story was, 
There was a thing back in the time, in 2006, there were these people saying, like, every CEO should have a blog. Just be totally transparent. Just be, have a blog and just be interacting directly with your consumer. And having interviewed many CEOs, I realized that was a really, really bad idea because they're all monsters, right? They're all sociopaths, right? So then I had this funny idea. What if one of them did do it? Because there were some CEOs doing it, but they're all fake, but, you know, phony. What if he had one and he really was an asshole? Right? And he's really saying offensive shit at night. He's drunk, maybe he's, had, he's a little high, right? And I tried all sorts of CEOs, but I, 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 none of them caught on. But this one caught on. And, and look at how ugly it is. I mean, look at this, the layout. It's just ugly. It was a blogger blog, right? But it started to take off, right? It, it went, next thing I have 10,000 readers. They have 100,000. They have a million. Then they have a million and a half readers of this stupid, like, shit blog, right? And I'm doing it anonymously, so nobody knows it's me. And everybody thinks it's someone cool. And they, they started this, this prize, like there was a, uh, 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 an award, any, a reward. Anyone who can find out who's fake Steve Jobs, we will give you a brand new iPod or something, right? The guy offering the reward was the publisher of Forbes, like my friend, right? I know this guy. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right? <laughs> but this is how much they disregarded me, even then, because of my age. I would be in meetings, and, and people were talking about this blog at Forbes, going like, you know what we need? We need something sexy like that fake Steve blog. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I could make something like that for you. They're like, no, 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 not you, not you. Not you. <laughs> like, I'm like, ha, 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 Right, so, so, um, so finally, I get caught. I, I came clean, and I got caught. And I had already told Forbes, but then the New York Times caught me. And, and everybody was disappointed because they're like, oh, we thought it was going to be somebody fun and hip and cool. And it's like this old guy in a suit, you know, like, oh, hello, I'm from Forbes. I write about IBM, you know. So, but what I did was I had the blog. I sold a book, a novel based on the blog. In the I wrote a, a Steve Jobs' fake autobiography. And, um, and, it was, and he's a monster in the book, right? And it didn't do that well, but it did a little bit. But then it was my third book. The other two totally failed. So this one didn't quite fail. I was like, oh, pretty good. And then... But what really happened is this guy, Larry Charles, who made Bruno and Borat, and he was on Curb Your Enthusiasm and Seinfeld, this big guy in Hollywood read it. He loved it. He's like, let's make a TV show. And we sold the TV show. So suddenly I'm like in Hollywood. I'm like, holy shit, this is great. I'm looking at houses. I'm going to LA, right? My wife is like, no, you're not. I'm like, look, if this happens, I'm going to be so unbearable. I know how bad I am now, but I'm going to be way worse. If, this, <laughs> if I become like rich Hollywood guy, forget it, right? Well, of course. It, we sold it to Epics. We waited like a year and a half, wrote all these episodes. It got canceled. So I'm like, shit. So I go back to New... I, I was still at Newsweek, but I, I'm back at Newsweek. Then Newsweek lays me off. Now I end up at HubSpot, and I'm writing blog posts, right, about, like, online marketing. Literally, I wrote a blog post, what is HTML, just to get Google search traffic. And I was like, this is the lowest point in my life, right? Really, the lowest point in my life. But... These idiots sold a show to HBO, a comedy set in Silicon Valley. By the way, we pitched HBO and they passed, so I was really pissed. But they took this thing instead. But these guys knew about my show, and they asked me to come out and work on season two and season three. Season one, they limped through, right? So suddenly, I actually am in LA. Like, I'm living in LA. No, they limped through season one. They were like, I don't know if we'll get renewed, but if we do, do you want to come? I was like, yes. So season two and three. So now I'm living the dream. I'm in LA, right? It's great. As you can see, so I think this was wired, like how I lucked into writing, because it was total luck, right? People would meet me and go like, how exactly did you get this job? Anyway, I didn't set the world on fire as a TV writer, but when I was there, I realized, oh, I had already been working at HubSpot. HubSpot would be a really good movie, right? But instead, I wrote it as a book. And it was really a Hail Mary pass, because by then, I had been tossed out of HubSpot. I didn't know what to do. I said, I'm going to write a funny book about my life. And at first, I thought I'd do a novel, and I said, no, I'll do a memoir. And this book, for whatever reason, I thought would just flop. But it, it's been translated into 12 languages. It was a bestseller. And I, ended up, I did sell movie rights. And so now these guys have me writing a movie based on my book. But the only reason they hired me to do the movie is that I worked on the TV show, right? So it's like, it's like this, right? Um, so the story has kind of gone up, down, up, down. Right now it's sort of up, and I'm just waiting for it to go down, like something bad's going to happen, right? I have a two-book contract to do two more books. So I've become this, this new, it's not really a career, but kind of, right? And I never, I didn't plan it. It was just completely accidental. Um, and it was all because one day, literally in 2006, I just started writing this really stupid blog, like really insanely stupid blog, right? Um, a, a move that, by the way, most people counseled me to stop doing, like it's career suicide. 
Like when you get found out, you're gonna get fired and you'll never work again. Like it's probably career suicide. And it turns out to be the only smart thing I've done in my life. And I did it completely by accident as a prank, right? Um, so this is great quote, sometimes serendipity is intention unmasked, right? I, it, to me, it still feels very accidental, but I feel like maybe, maybe there was some subconscious plan. I, I, I don't even know. Like, I, I really don't know if there was somehow I knew it would all work out. My favorite quote is this one. Um, oh, God, that didn't, that didn't work out very well. In the movie Barfly, which I love, uh, there's a great line of dialogue where someone says, nothing but dumb luck, and, and Henry Chernovsky says, yeah, but that counts too. That's just basically how I feel. It's like, I got lucky, but I don't care. I'm calling it a win, right? Um, <laughs> To sum up, if you're thinking about boomers and Gen X, right, this fear, remember that. If you're teaching a room full of Gen Xers and boomers, they're afraid. They're afraid of looking stupid. They're afraid that you already think they don't know how to use technology, right? They're dealing with this new compact where jobs last a year and a half, two years instead of a career. Age bias, new technologies. But I do believe that they're hungry for learning because they know it's the only way to hang on now, the only way to hang on to your job is to learn new stuff. You cannot stay where you are, and everybody knows that, right? But you can kind of freeze with paralysis because you're afraid of jumping into something new. On the reinvention front, I feel like what I did with blogs, blogs have come and gone. It doesn't matter. The pla blogging platform was a thing for a while, right? But I think new platforms represent new opportunities. You know, you just jump on it, play with it, shape it. Some of them are so new that the people who are the users of the system are the ones shaping what the technology will end up being, right? And there's no risk, right? Yes, you're afraid. I feel like fear is a good thing. Nobody ever wants to say that, but I think fear is what, you know, wakes you up in the morning, keeps you up at night, but gets you working harder, right? So use that fear, right? But there is no risk. There is nothing to lose. If, especially if you're on one early, nobody else knows what they're doing on these platforms either, right? Um, seriously. Um, the rules in these things haven't been written yet. So ultimately, I think that's the way you make yourself invaluable to your company. It's the way you make yourself indispensable. And I think you can do that regardless of your age. Right? There's one quote that I love from Steve Martin. When some people ask him, how do I make it in showbiz? How do I, how do I break into the business? And his, it sounds glib, but I don't think it is, is be so good they can't ignore you. Just like basically be so good that someone wants you. They're coming to you. You're not knocking on their door. They're calling you, right? So maybe you choose a new technology, you play around with it, and you fail. Maybe the technology fails. You jump on Vine, and then they kill Vine, right? Um, it's the wrong platform. So you swing to the next one. The, the next quote really sums up my life. Thankfully, persistence is a great substitute for talent. I, I feel like that's the story of the last 10 years of my life. I'm not really that good. I just won't go away. And, uh, <laughs> and, and eventually, they just have to do something with you, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, I hope, you know, I got 10 more years. Um, and, the last quote that I'd like to leave you with is, is the one from Steve Jobs when he gave his commencement address. He took this from the Whole Earth Catalog. Stay hungry, stay foolish. I feel like no matter what your age is, I still feel young. I don't feel that old, except, you know, when I walk. But, I mean, um, <laughs> but, you, but you know what I mean? I don't think, you know, I think if you're 55, 60, whatever, you can still learn new things. You can still stay hungry. You can still stay foolish. You can still... Um, fall and fail and keep getting up. And that's the way to stay young and to stay vital. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you. I think there's time for questions if, if anybody has some. Thank you very much. Thanks, though. Um, I, are there, is there time? For, okay. Does anybody have a question? There's a microphone, or you can just yell it out, and I'll repeat the question. No, everybody wants to go to the drinks. They're like, dude, get me out of here. It's, it sucks being the guy who's the last person between the crowd and the drinks. Um, By the, far the best, though. What? By far the best. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, the woman in the back, you had a question. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much. This was enlightening. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you said that with a funny voice, though. It's like uh, the stock, like the scare quote. No, it was no, it's now. all yeah, the things uh, I, it's yeah. all the things I've been thinking, but <laughs> have not been brave enough to say. <laughs> so, very helpful. So we we have a lot of diversity of age and, and talents, but I, I'm going to use a personal example to try to to get to what I I deal with. Uh, a lot. So my 22-year-old, who has just graduated from college, just started her new job, called me yesterday frantic, saying that she was in a one-on-one -on -one with her boss, who is a um, baby boomer, 
and her boss gave her some feedback and the feedback was very frank and said, you didn't do a good job with your product pitch. And, um, but really didn't follow it up with what she could have done better. And my daughter's um, reply to me was, does somebody tell you guys that millennials just want to be, you know, told just direct stuff? You know, does somebody tell you that, you know, is there something that people <laughs> just tell millennials that we just want to be told to our face just really rude and direct things because that's not how we want to be communicated with at all. Oh, and really? And it just really summarized for me, <laughs> you know, how, how, how big of a gap we really have. And, um, and, I, and I asked her, I said, well, did you ask your boss, you know, what could you do, you know, if you wanted to know? And she said, no, I was just so mad. I just, I just stayed quiet. So, yeah. it, so I'm just curious if any other, if everybody else is having these kind of gaps and, and communication issues, because I certainly know it's happening in our business and in my house, apparently. <laughs> I, I didn't know that about the, the millennials and, and communication. I first of all think, I don't think they're that big a difference. I think we fetishize millennials and we put them in this box and we say they're this, this, and this as a way of shorthanding it. I actually feel like HubSpot actually was a, a big misread on millennials. I don't think they really care so much about beer or ping pong or foosball. I think they want, they want what we want. They want a career development. They want to get promotions. They want to, you know, they're impatient. I remember being 25. I was super impatient. I wanted all those old people to get the hell out of the way. Like, get, the, get out of my way. You know what I mean? I know better than you, you know what I mean? Like, I think that's, that's normal. That, that energy is good, in, but um, yeah, so I don't know if millennials are really that different from anybody else, but it sounds like her boss just doesn't um, communicate or give feedback in, in a great way. There's this new book called Radical Candor by Kim Scott from Silicon Valley. It was, it was a great book, but I think it is, maybe people are misreading it to think like, you just need to be rude. You know, it's like, it's not her point at all. She says, you should be direct. You're not doing anybody a favor by lying to them and, and padding it and not telling them that they're falling short and then firing them. You should, you know, so maybe, maybe he's trying to be uh, candid in a radical way. I don't know. There was uh, another question. Sorry. Um, oh, oh, did you have a, oh. Uh, two book deal coming. What is your next one? It's called Lab Rats, and it's about uh, things like Agile and Lean and what it does to people when you're sitting there in a lab, like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. See, oh, good. I hope it'll, uh, that makes me feel back, better because I've been struggling with it. Like, I really, really, like, I spent a year reporting it, and then I sat down to write it, and I was like, oh, this sucks, no one's gonna read this. And then, then I had to write this movie treatment, so I took a break, and I was like, thank God, because I hate that book. But I hope it'll, I think it's hilarious. I feel like, I, often at HubSpot, I felt like we were lab rats, because they would bring in, like, somebody would bring in Agile. Not even company-wide, like some department guy, but not full Agile, just a little bit Agile, and they throw in a little lean. Like, we, we're gonna have a scrum, but we're gonna have a Kanban, we're gonna have a scrum band. Like, seriously, there's like hybrids of, 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 now people blend it. Or there's holacracy, you know, like, and these people don't know what they're doing. They've never had a job before. Some of them are like really, they've, not only they've never run a company or ha been a manager, literally, they have never had a job before, and now they're like your boss. Like, okay, we're gonna try this. And they're like, oh. So I just felt like I was being experimented on, you know what I mean? Like how many times, how much will people put up with before they leave? Let's try that one, you know? It's like, it's like the Stanford uh, prison experiment or, you know, the Milgram experiment. Like, keep turning the dial, you know? Um, um, I'm sorry. So, so that's, that's the first one. The second one, I don't even know. I actually, um, I don't know. So, I'm sorry. And, and you, you, sir, yeah. yes. Um, this is actually like a two-part question, um, but partially towards the young lady back here, the, her, your daughter, and then also for you to answer. Um, I've heard, in a sense, uh, I've got a 22-year-old son, and, you know, I, I don't know if that's Gen X or Millennial, X, Y, whatever, but um, one of the things that I've noticed is they, they grow up nowadays with uh, the kind of thing like, you know, we had a contest, everybody's a winner, you know, so that kind of, I, I'm wondering how that, you know, is different from, you know, when we grew up, where it was like, hey, first place, great, second place, yeah, third place, you kissed your sister, you know, kind of, that, that kind of effect. Well, um, I don't know where you grew up, but I mean, I, I, I just, it certainly didn't happen where I grew up, sir. I'm right, telling you that but, much right now. But, uh, that was fourth place <laughs> where I grew up. A, so part, part, of, part of the question was, um, you know, I kind of sensed that if, if you teach your children that, you know, hey, there's going to be some rejection, then you don't have to worry about that. But the other part is, I've noticed that you know, the older generation, and I'm talking about older than us. They're, they're, they're CEOs. Really old guys. Yeah, they're really old guys. Yeah. Um, when you go to them and, and you pitch something to them, uh, yes or no is what you get, instead of, hey, here's how to make it so 
I'll accept it. Or here's how to, here's how to put that presentation together so I can take it to the president and he'll buy off on it. Because they're not going to do the work for you. They yeah. want you to give it to them the way they need to present it. But they never tell you what that is. Oh. How does one get past that? I, I, mean, don't, know. I, I don't know. And I think it's, it's, it's so, it varies so much from uh, situation to situation. But one thing that strikes me is that, you know, I've also done some writing about age by uh, age, not age in, the, in the workplace and the multi-generational workforce that people talk about now and how do we blend that and yet yeah, EMC, this tech company, well, you know EMC, um, they have these like circles and people get together and talk and different ages and the different things and, and I feel like, you know, we sort of tiptoe around all this stuff and, and, and we, we it's, it's essentially what we just, like when we were, when we were kids, we just called it work. Like my first job, I was young, I was still in college, I was working at a newspaper, and it was when computers were first coming into the newsroom and they had gone from typewriters, and there were these old guys, and they were genuinely old guys, old sports writers, and they would work nights and all the college kids worked nights because we, we had the crappy hours, right? So we're working with the guys, and they couldn't figure out how to use the computers, right? So they would call us, and we'd go over and make jokes about them wearing adult diapers and you know that kind of stuff, and, and, and we'd fix the computer for them. And then we'd get stuck writing a story, and they'd be like, dude, Here's how you write a story. Like you write the lead like this, right? Like they just they would teach us. Like we had we learned how to write a story from them. And then we all went out drinking. And I remember thinking at the time, like, this is cool. Like I'm 25. I'm like partying, like literally in a bar, getting wasted with guys who are like my grandfather's age. And this and they're they're awesome. They're really good guys. And we didn't we didn't have to have a multi-generational task force work work group thing. We just <laughs> they just, you know, we gave we made fun of them, they made fun of us, and you know, we all lived, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like, you know, communicating is, is part of it. I feel like maybe having those conversations is, is a first step toward, toward uh, uh, you know, like getting over that, like being able to talk about your age and, 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 and their age, you know. And, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's definitely an awkward situation if you're working for someone who's much younger than you. I've had that experience. And I think it's awkward for both of you. It's really awkward for the young boss. You know, they have somebody like their dad who's working for them now, and it's, it's weird. And I see why they don't want to hire that person, because, like, I don't want to manage my dad, you know? It's like, it's a, I, I think it, you just have to kind of talk it through. Are there any other questions or, or um, oh, yes. Sure. I want to know, um, who do you want to play you in the movie? Okay, I, I have many jokes on this, because people ask me a lot of times. So one is Flavor Flav, right? Because I, I have met... <laughs> I have met Flavor Flav. I, I know Flavor. He doesn't know me, but I met him once a long time ago. But no, I, I actually don't think it'll get made. I, I think most of these things you get hired, you write a screenplay. Like most of the guys I worked with in Silicon Valley have written movies. They, they have written lots of movies. Movies that never got made. You know, Dodgeball 2. The guy spent a year writing Dodgeball 2. There never was a Dodgeball 2. But I mean, like, yeah, so you, I think most of the work is work you do to write the screen. But, you know, I don't know. Yeah, you could, you know. Somebody dorky, you know, uh, somebody, yeah, I guess, I, I, you know, it's, uh, it, there's no good way to answer that question. If you say somebody cool, like, well, George Clooney, it's like, oh, you're an egomaniac, you know, <laughs> and you say, um, no, I don't know, like, I, I, I can't even imagine, it has to be, yeah, I don't know. There's a guy named Martin Freeman on Sherlock, he's an English guy, but he can play American, and he's kind of a, he was Jim in the office, in the British version of the office, and he's a little older now, he has gray hair, I think he'd be good, he's kind of like puckish, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? He can make a joke, but he's not, yeah. Like, you don't want Jim Carrey, right? Like, you know, yeah, but I don't think. Uh, I mean, we take it, but trust me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, take, I take anyone at this point. Yeah. Um, any, any other questions or? Oh, yes. I'll repeat the question. Okay. You know, as people are getting to this stage, maintaining their sense of worth as yeah. they have to realign their identity, after, after, as they have moved along in their career, they have their skill sets and those skill sets are discounted. What advice do you have for folks who are kind of going through that process? I, I'll tell you, it's, yeah, uh, thank you for asking that question because it's a, it's a pretty honest question and I'll try to be honest answering it. Um, like, it's a crushing experience. People will sometimes say to me, like, so, you know, the, you must be glad that you know, got laid off and took this job because, uh, you know, you got this book out of it. Like, no, like, really, it was a really unhappy experience. And, and um, 
if I could go back in time and Newsweek was still doing great and I, I loved that job, I loved being a journalist. I loved working at Newsweek. To me, I used to pinch myself every day when I went in, like, I can't believe they hired me. I can't believe I work with these amazing people. I loved what I did. I loved it. And I felt like I was good at it. Not great, but I was good at it. I had done it a long time. No, it, and it was, it's soul destroying. It's really, you, know, you say, oh, it's humbling, blah, blah, blah. No, it's, it's, you know, or it's good to fail. You'll learn from like, you know, sometimes failing sucks, right? Like it sucks. And I mean, I had really hard times. If you read the book, I, I think that's one thing also, especially people in our town. I live in a little town outside Boston. So our friends all read the book, right? I never thought of that when I'm writing it. Like I'm trying to be really honest and lay my soul out here, you know? And then I think now people read it and they're like, oh God, I never knew it was that bad. Like, you know, like nights where you can't sleep, like you just can't. I lie awake all night, like sweating, or, or I, can't, I can't do anything but sleep. Like I sleep all, I sleep 12 hours, I go to bed, I come home from work, I put on my pajamas and go to bed, and I wake up at eight and I'm like, I can still sleep. Like, you know, just massive depression, you know? There's a, a scene in the book early on where after I got laid off at Forbes, the, the HubSpot thing didn't happen right away. There was a, a period where I was looking for a job, then a period where I had this really bad job where I was commuting to San Francisco to run a blog, and I remember at one point putting my son to bed. And my son, I have twins, a boy and a girl. And they're 12 now, but they were like seven then. And my son's really the sensitive one. And he's looking at me, and I could see in his eyes, like, like pity. Like he felt bad for me. He knew what I was going through, like trying to find a job and how like humiliating it was in a way. And um, yeah, and he felt bad for me. And like it almost killed me. I was like, I, I was almost going to cry. You know, I sort of made a little joke so that we could both laugh. And I put it in a bed. But I, and I walked out like, shit, i got to get a job. Like, now, nah, like any job. I'll take anything, right? But it was, yeah, I mean, it was, there were moments, like really bad, agonizing, dark night of the soul kind of moments. And I don't think, you know, I think you're, if you're giving a talk like this, you're supposed to say, bud, here are the three things you do, blah, 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 you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know. I mean, the thing that kept me going was my kids. Like, I got to, you know, at least got to feed them. I started thinking for a while, I have a good life insurance policy. If I could get hit by a bus, but you can't kill yourself with life insurance, right? So, but if I could get hit by a bus or, you know, make it look like an accident, right? Um, uh, smoke a lot of cigarettes, get cancer or something. Like, you know, uh, it, it would be better off them. At least they'd be taken care of, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, no, but it was, um, it's really a grind. I think you have to be prepared for that. And, and I would, you know, on the ups, it feels very bipolar, like, because on the ups, it's like, holy shit, TV show, oh, no, unemployed, you know. Um, and I think that's another thing that I think is different for us, for my generation, in this world. You're now dealing with those mood swings. You're dealing with those ups and downs a lot more frequently than you used to. I mean, it used to be people talked about, I hate my job. It's just like, oh, take this job and shove it. I go to work, my boss was a jerk, you know. But, but you weren't worried about, like, oh, shit, a month from now, I'm going to get thrown out, and now I got to, you know, you're back on the streets over and over and over again, which is what Silicon Valley is talking about, right? So I think that, that mood swing, maybe young people are, are okay with it because it's all they've ever known. They've never known the, the you know, thing of working 10 years at a company. And, you know, sometimes you like it, sometimes you don't. But yeah, I think uh, having to deal with that emotionally and psychologically is, is a really big part of this new world for, for people my age and, and up, unfortunately. You know, sorry, yes. Well, however, they didn't hire me back for season four, which is the last season. And you'll notice it went way downhill. It did. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say it. I haven't seen the episodes, but, but I've been told. Season three was brilliant. And I think when I watch that show, having lived through many of these business cycles. Which three cycles do you mean? 87? 87. Two, uh, 2001. 01. Yeah. Yeah, I was an Arthur Anderson partner. Okay. So, you were um, what? Arthur Anderson partner. So yeah. anyway. Um, Thank you for doing that. I th and I think what you should do is maybe, because I have a millennial and a, and, a, and a generation X, and the millennial is always watching Tim and Eric. So I think you should hook up with Tim and Eric and, and figure out something funny to do. What, what is it again? Tim? Tim and Eric. Oh, Tim and Eric. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those yeah, guys. They, they do I, these 15-minute yeah, television I, programs, and they're just hilarious. And, but the comedy is, is really My good. son's 12, and he watches these Logan Paul videos. And Jake Paul, have any of you heard those? 
if you want to just kill yourself, just like, oh. <laughs> and he plays them. I, so I put headphones on so I don't have to listen to these imbeciles in the background, like, yeah, bro, you know. And this, but that's TV now. Like, I think for that generation, that is going to be, YouTube is TV for my, my son. But anyway, I, I don't know if there are any others or if we should wrap it up. I think we should wrap it up, right? Is it? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Thanks Everyone, so round of applause. Dan Lyons. Thank you so much.